Welcome, everybody. I'm Sven Hosford with another edition of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast. Today is October 28th, 2014. Got a great show for you today. Uh, lots of stuff we're going to be talking about with veterans. First up, uh, we're going to be talking with Dan Libby. He's a PhD, uh, an executive director with the Veterans Yoga Project. And that's uh, He's coming to town to teach some yoga teachers some very special things. Um, and we'll be talking with him. I uh, want to remind everybody, first off, that the print issue of our magazine is out there, and uh, it'll be out there for another month. Uh, the new issue, winter issue, will be coming out in December, and uh, coming up in this, uh, in two weeks, I'm sorry, next week, uh, one of the authors in this, Sana Karapalati, is going to be here to talk about using hypnotherapy to reduce the stress around surgery. I had a talk with her. It's a fascinating subject. And in two weeks, we're going to be talking with Susan Silberstein. Uh, she's a doctor, PhD, a founder and president of the Can Center for Advancement in Cancer Education. Now, here's a, here's a statement for you. This is an organization that believes 90% of all cancers can be eliminated through environment and lifestyle choices alone. And science agrees. Unfortunately, most people don't know it. So we're going to find out a whole bunch more about that in two weeks uh, from Susan Silberman. So to kick off our calendar of events this week, let's check in with Jenna Leidy. Uh, she is an author and yoga teacher living in Pittsburgh. Her first novel, He Never Liked Cake, tells the story of growing up with her father's traumatic brain injury. And her second book, Yoga for Brain Injury, Move, Feel, Think, a guidebook of 20 postures is available for pre-order on pubslush.com. You can find out... Uh, find a whole lot of her work about uh, talking about yoga on mindbodygreen.com. How are you doing today, uh, Jana? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing just great. Thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. So tell us about the event you've got coming up. Um, I have an event coming up that's on Veterans Day. So Tuesday, the 11th of November. And it's basically... It's a one hour yoga class at a really cool space in Pittsburgh called the Cloak Room. And there haven't been a lot of events there quite yet. And it's not open to the public, but it's a, it's a fun space. So that's what we were trying to do is take it out of a yoga studio, take it out of a gym, take it out of any sort of meeting center and, and make it fun so that it's kind of a little bit of a celebration, um, a, a chance on Veterans Day to honor veterans, but most importantly, a way to get yoga out into that particular community of people who have um, sort of any kind of challenge that has to do, whether it's a combat injury, whether it has to do just maintaining a happy, normal, healthy lifestyle, because I think that yoga is a really great complement that pretty much anyone can do. And I've done a little bit of work that started with brain injury, but is branching off into PTSD and other forms of trauma to bring yoga to this population. So you're, you're actually working with both the physical and uh, mental and emotional aspects of healing uh, some yes. pretty traumatic things using yoga. Yeah. Um, it started because my father has a traumatic brain injury. And I wanted to see if a yoga practice, a routine practice, basic poses, would be able to help him overcome things, different things, but overcome things in the same way this practice has helped me overcome things. And I find that a lot of time people that have a traumatic brain injury or have been through any sort of trauma have sort of the, a, a disconnect or a weakening of the connection of mind and body. Mm. And yoga is all about bringing the two together, mind, body, breath. There's all kinds of the trifecta of things, but really mind and body. And the stronger that connection becomes, the more you're able to live in your present moment and start to make decisions about who you are today and just really get really present, which I think is a great way to begin the process of healing from a trauma, whether it's physical, whether it's mental. Um, my father's injury happens to be much more mental than physical. Hmm. So I was very curious to see if this yoga practice could actually help him be less impulsive, be more compassionate, um, make better decisions, things like that. And it did. <laughs> and yeah. so since it did, I thought, okay, let's, Let's invite all kinds of other people to try this out. And yeah. how, how did it work with your father? How did it work? Yeah. Well, his main, he's a brain injury. So his main um, 
deficit, if you will, is he has problems with executive function, which is basically like if your brain were a hard drive and the hard drive crashed. You've got all the programs, you just can't run them. They're not there, you can't access them. So it makes it very difficult for him to be an adult that has a normal lifestyle in terms of he could balance his own checkbook, he could live in, live on his own. I mean, to see him and to talk to him, it's fine. And you wouldn't really think one way or another. But all of these long-term things that we've been challenged with with him for years, and some of it too is flat affect, so his emotions can be a little off. In a nutshell, his personality totally changed. Hmm. And yoga, it's such a hard thing to explain in words, and even though I'm a writer, but it really was able to do a lot more than other treatments, be they, I, I mean, any, any sort of treatments, medications, whatever, it was able to do that extra of allowing to him, him to understand his injury, allowing him to understand his limitations, allowing him to understand how he can grow away from those limitations and not really fight against them. And I think it, it, for him, it broke down to be as simple as you get on your yoga mat, and you learn to move very consciously. You learn to move in a way that you know that if you bring your leg back and you step it forward, it's either gonna go this far forward or it's kind of not. You're gonna have to think your way around that. And the practice that I teach is vinyasa. And the actual definition of that is to put or place in a special way. So just this idea of him 30 minutes a day, 40 minutes of the day, pretty basic poses, just taking that time, being in his space with his own body, his own thoughts, his own process, and learning how to move in a, in a special way was able to go off the mat. And he will tell you too, it makes me slow down. And you wouldn't think you'd want to technically slow down. But when he says that, it means he is able to start to think before he talks, think before he acts, understand this idea of cause and effect, of consequence, have things, you know, and then that filters all the way into remorse and compassion because you start to understand how you exist and then how you exist as you do to the world around you hmm. which like i said it's such a giant conversation yeah but the movement helped him moving helped him more than just sitting and being still because i think when you go through a trauma it's really hard to ask to be asked to just sit and think or sit and clear your mind or sit and think about something positive or sit and imagine it differently because your brain's going crazy, and especially those with brain injury where the processes are actually failing. Mm. But anyone, I mean, I have friends who have husbands, and I've met people along the way. When you come back from overseas, whatever goes on over there, you don't really want to sit down and think about how to get over it. Yeah. yeah. So how, so it was it working with your dad that led you to uh, give up your glamorous life of being a writer and become a, a yoga teacher? Um, yes, because I, there was so much pain in, in living so closely with a brain injury and so many other people I had met. And I didn't know a lot of children who had parents. And I just wanted to do my part to somehow help us all heal or cope or understand or just find the positive in this. And I realized that I was doing that with him, that things were just kind of sort of working. And it's funny because it works more, you see it more when he doesn't practice than when he does. But it's like, that's how I see my own yoga practice. When I don't practice, I'm like, oh man, I gotta get back to the mat because such and such and such. It's different for all of us. Right. And that's why I like it so much. It's such a universal concept to practice yoga but you can make it as personal as you want to. So there really isn't anyone that you can just like to not include from this. But um, I saw positive changes. My mom saw positive changes. He, he just was a little smoother in the way that he lived his life. And at the end of the day, that's kind of just like what we want. Like it's not a challenge all the time, maybe just sometimes. And he was more aware with the challenges. So he would work with them rather than against them. He developed an amazing experience acceptance and understanding for what happened, even if he couldn't understand what was happening, if that makes sense. And I just thought so many more people could benefit from this. And I, so I started looking at all these yoga books out there and I'm like, well, where's one where we really get down into personality changes and mental mm -hmm. challenges and behavioral and psychology. And I would be like, oh, yoga for sciatica, yoga to cure cancer, not cure, but to obviously sure. part of that treatment plan. And it, I found that it was part of a treatment plan for so many things, but not this. 
and it's kind of like my first book. Well, no one's done it from this perspective. Yeah. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. So and that shot is at the printer right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's very exciting. As we speak. That's very exciting. So now uh, you have ongoing classes and you work with veterans and people with brain injuries or what all do you, who all do you work with now? Pilot program. So hopefully we'll be able to return to that with something a little bit more, um, more towards the long term. I've okay. done it with a rehabilitation remed in Pittsburgh here. Um, that was an amazing experience. Everyone was kind of blown away by the changes they saw in their clients on quote unquote yoga day, which was Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. They had a sense of purpose. They were disciplined. They wore like an outfit. They did their laundry because there was just something about that that gave back to their life. And it's not my job to figure out how to give it back to them. It's just my job to introduce them to it. Um, I did something with Wounded Warrior Project and oh, yeah. I'm in talks with the VA to maybe bring it into the, um, the CB unit. One of their nurse managers wants to start a, a pretty routine yoga class. So we're at the very beginning. That's They've only awesome. been here a year. So. Oh, that's awesome. So I was in New York uh, last July. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, welcome. You're from Pittsburgh originally, right? Yes. Okay. I'm well, welcome. Really welcome home. Yes. <laughs> and so November 11th, uh, the Cloak Room in East Liberty, you'll be teaching a yoga class. What th what time does it start? It starts at 5.30, goes till 6.30, and then there'll be some snacks and beverages and a time to chat, ask questions, meet lots of other great teachers who want to go in this direction as well and just hang out. Like Awesome. And just five yeah. bucks or a donation of some uh, sweatpants uh, for the yes. VA. I'm looking for men's sweatpants, medium, large, and extra large. Excellent. I asked what they did most, and that is what they needed most. So that's what I hope to give them. Well, how can people uh, get in touch with you? They can email me at movefeelthink at gmail.com. And um, not not to correct you, but some it's hard to keep up with your bios online. Oh, yeah. The book Longer on, <laughs> available for pre-order on PubSlush, but it will soon be available for order through my own website, movefeelthink.com. So Move that's, feel that's all in process. Well, so that's a lot awesome. Of things in process, but we all have yoga. That doesn't stop or start. That's right. <laughs> well, God bless you and all your work, and uh, we'll see you on November 11th. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. You bet. Take care. Also in the calendar, looking ahead, this weekend's busy weekend. We've got Nutra Pharmacy's sixth annual Women's Wellness Two-Day event. This is an open house that features all kinds of vendors, samples, discounts, speakers. You can find out all about it at Nutra Pharmacy, N-U-T-R-I-F-A-R-M-A-C-Y.com. Uh, that's this Friday and Saturday from 10 until 3 on both days. Also on Saturday, it's the Pittsburgh Vegan Festival. It's a new location now at the Unitarian Universalist Church of North Hills. That's on West Ingemar Road up uh, uh, in Ross Township, I think that is. Pittsburgh Vegan Festival Fall Edition 2014. Explore the many wonderful vegan options Pittsburgh has to offer all in one place. Vendors, entertainment, games, food, drink, desserts, products, and services. Be sure to bring lots of extra cash for, or cash for the vendors Coming up on Thursday, November 6th, we'll be at the Women's Health Conversation with Dr. Vonda Wright. You've seen her on Dr. Oz. Now you can meet her in person. Go to womenshealthconversations.com. And on Saturday, November 15th, it's Juice Fest. This is uh, Trenton Ozipak and the gang at Organically Social going to put on a big contest. See who's got the best juice in town, blind tasting, testing. Should be a really good time. We're also going to have the meetup group uh, there. The meetup group is our integrative medicine professionals. If you go to meetup.com, we're almost up to 150 members now. So if you're in any way uh, in the wellness business and you'd like to meet some other like-minded people, then this is the place to go, meetup.com and at Juice Fest. Uh, really looking forward to that, Saturday, November 15th. And then just announced on the 16th of November at the Schwartz Living Market, our friend Patty Lemmer is going to be uh, doing a Pittsburgh launch of her new book, Outsmarting Autism. You saw her here on the podcast a few months ago talking all about her book. Well, now here's a chance to meet her for free. Uh, there's going to be some vegan brownies, I believe, of some sort from uh, Maya at Zest Wishes. Uh, this is all at the Schwartz Living Market, Sunday, November 16th, 2 to 4 p.m., free parking behind that on Bingham Street. 
That is it for the calendar this week. Next up is Dan Levy. Daniel Libby is the founder and executive director of the Veterans Yoga Project, which is an educational and advocacy organization dedicated to improving the health and well-being of military veterans. He's also a licensed clinical psychologist and a yoga teacher specializing in the mindful integration of evidence-based psychotherapies in complementary and alternative medicine practices for the treatment of PTSD and other psychological and emotional distress in active duty and military veterans. He'll be in town November 14th through the 16th at Schoolhouse Yoga, where he'll be teaching uh, the Mindful Resilience for Trauma Recovery Veterans Yoga Project Teacher Training. We actually be teaching yoga teachers. Welcome, Dan Libby. Thank you for having me. So your uh, your Veterans Yoga Project, it says on the website uh, that you're a nonprofit educa- uh, organization dedicated to aiding recovery and promoting resiliency among veterans, their families, and their communities. Tell us about how you build resiliency. I love that word. Um, resilience uh, or resiliency really just refers to our ability to bounce back from life's inevitable challenges. And so... Um, To me, recovery and resilience are sort of the same thing. We're um, not only sort of recovering from maybe things that have uh, affected us in the past, but to be able to to develop the inner resources that we all have uh, to be able to more effectively deal with some of life's more traumatic challenges. So you offer a lot of free training on your site. You have a, a book, basically, that people can download. You've got sample medi- uh, meditations. What? Tell us about some of the other activities you do to help educate uh, wellness and integrative medicine professionals. Sure. So um, on the, like I said, on the website, we have um, some resources. And actually, probably next week, we're about to launch our online practice library, or at least a new version of it where you'll be able to go to the website and download or stream audio practices, whether they be short breathing practices, meditations, yoga nidra practices. Um, The idea is that, you know, for people who might not be interested in going to a yoga class or they just want to try a few things or um, they just want to learn some different techniques, they can be able to go to the website and to use those tools. Um, so that's what we offer for veterans and for other people. Um, obviously, it's not just veterans that uh, are dealing with trauma and PTSD. And of course, not every veteran is dealing with trauma or PTSD. Sure. Uh, but by promoting, um, by providing those resources, we're hoping to um, enable people to develop those inner resources that they need to become more resilient, but also to allow them to be able to uh, process through and move through maybe previous traumas. Well, you've got a, a, an amazing list of credentials. Do you want to give us a, a short biography of uh, how you got to where you are now? Um, that is a good question, and sometimes I don't know how I got to where I am now. <laughs> um, it started, uh, well, I mean, we can go pretty far back, um, but it started out when I was a massage therapist. I was a body worker working at a place called the Feathered Pipe Ranch, which is this phenomenal educational retreat, uh, retreat center out in Helena, Montana. And when I was working on people physically, a lot of psycho-emotional stuff would come up. And I sort of wouldn't know how to deal with that. We know when somebody would start crying on my table or they would tell me about these, you know, memories that they had, you know, just sort of uh, spontaneously coming to them. So I went back to school to become a psychologist, um, became a clinical psychologist, studied a little bit about trauma and physiology. And then it wasn't until I went to, um, to a postdoctoral fellowship with Yale University and the West Haven VA that I really became uh, sort of, um, I don't know what the word is, is I became very passionate about this work and especially about working with veterans who are dealing with post-traumatic stress and other trauma-related um, issues. Hmm. So really, at first I came through it through the physical ends and then spent a lot of time in, in graduate school really learning about the mental piece of it, right? And, and using mind psychotherapeutic techniques. And so now I'm at a point in my career where I'm really bringing these things together because trauma, PTSD is a body-mind issue, right? It is a psychophysiological disorder. And so really the best way to treat a psychophysiological challenge is with psychophysiological techniques. 
And really that's what I found to be the most helpful is using these techniques of mindfulness and meditation and breathing practices and some of the movement practices as well. Yeah. How did you first discover yoga? When did that fit into the equation? It must have been the first summer I went uh, out to the Feathered Pipe Ranch um, when I was about 18 or 19. I, I went out there for a week, um, but I was only there for about two days. And I called home and I told them I'm not coming back. And they <laughs> gave me a job, uh, you know, doing dishes and cleaning rooms. They gave me a tent in the woods. And I was really just blessed to be able to sit in on some, you know, yoga classes with you know, like world-class yoga teachers, these are the yoga rock stars, mm -hmm. the, um, the ones that really helped bring yoga and popularize it in, in, the, in the West. Wow. So I was really very fortunate to learn from some of yoga's um, sort of original best yoga teachers. Um, I, now, that's are, where I first learned about yoga. Okay. Now, are you a veteran yourself? I am not a veteran myself. I um, have some veterans in my family. Was, my grandfather was a World War II and Korean vet. Okay. And my uncle actually uh, died while in duty, on duty. Um, so although I'm not a vet myself, I, through this work, have seen how tragedy, um, you know, my, my uncle, I think, was 19 at the time, young Air Force um, uh, service member. And so seeing what that did to the family dynamic and seeing how that affects um, people, I think, is partly what got me into this work. But it was really not until I started to working with the vets and working at the VA that, you know, working with this particular population sort of uh, took a hold. It really wasn't anything I had ever planned to do. Well, that's very interesting. So um, one of the things it says uh, on your uh, on your website there for the, for the Veterans Project is uh, uh, Daniel conducted research investigating the neural correlates of mindfulness, meditation, as well as the first epidemiological Epid I can't even say this word, epidemiological investigation of complementary alternative medicine in a VA PTSD treatment program. Can you, uh, can you translate that to English for us? Uh, what, what's the focus of your research here? Yeah, th those words were just to make me uh, look and sound smart. Um, <laughs> uh, PhDs are good at that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, one uh, line of research I was working on was with a, uh, a researcher named Judd Brewer who um, – was doing a lot of research looking at mindfulness practices for addiction. And so we looked at um, uh, participants who were going through treatment for a cigarette addiction, and we were looking at heart rate variability, which is a measure um, of, it's, it's a rough measure of parasympathetic tone, basically, and being able to look at the autonomic nervous system. And so we were able to show that there was a correlation between um, people's abilities to uh, reduce the amount of cigarettes they were smoking and the what their heart rate variability looked like during meditation. Uh, another line of research was really just trying to find out, you know, when I first got to the VA, I was really surprised to find out that they were doing yoga in the PTSD program. They uh, just started bringing in a yoga teacher from the community who was, uh, you know, starting to work with uh, veterans there in the outpatient program. And I was really surprised. And I thought, well, do all VAs do this? And there was no way to answer that question because even though I had access to the administrative data, there was nowhere in the administrative data that captured that this was a yoga group, right? Sometimes it was coded as recreational therapy. Sometimes it's group psychotherapy. Sometimes, you know, there was just a whole sort of range of ways that it's captured in their computerized record system. Hmm. So what I was able to do was to divine, devise a survey that we sent out to all 170 of the specialized PTSD treatment programs in the country, uh, in the VA. And uh, after harassing them to please return their survey, we got about 70% of them back and was able to see what types of complementary and alternative medicine practices were being used by these PTSD treat treatment programs. So we asked them about 32 different types of complementary and alternative medicine practices, focusing mostly um, or elaborating, we asked them about these 32 therapies, but then we asked them more detailed questions about six particular therapies, including yoga and mindfulness. Really trying to get at, you know, who's teaching these classes, what kind of, you know, yoga is very problematic when it comes to research because yoga doesn't mean anything. There's no operational definition to, so when somebody says we do yoga, there's really no way to, you know, what does that mean? Yeah. So we wanted to know and understand like how much of that is breathing practices versus meditation versus movement. What style of yoga are you doing? 
incorporating resting practices like yoga nidra. Um, and so we were able to um, get a little snapshot of what was happening at the VA at that time, which is now three plus years old, maybe four years old. And so um, my sense is that in those three or four years, the use of yoga has just, especially for trauma, for veterans, has just exploded. Um, and it's happening everywhere. And it's really exciting to see that this is really becoming a viable treatment option and a complementary part of available for a complementary part of therapy for for many veterans. Um, so I think that's a that's a very good thing. So those are my two primary areas of research. Hmm. Right now we're working on um, we're recruiting veterans and active duty military who do practice yoga, and we're um, asking them to complete a survey to let us know what they find useful about that yoga practice. And so uh, there's a link to that, I believe, on our website. Uh, that's through our partnership with uh, the University of Connecticut and Crystal Park, who's the primary investigator of that study. So um, involved in research and, and little bits and pieces, but I really prefer the sort of hands-on, the clinical work, and um, actually getting these practices into the hands of the people that use them. You know, sure. We can use them now. Well, that's what I do want to talk about that next. But what what was the your results with the VA? What uh, how many hospitals are using and what kind of yoga? Where are the results of that? Uh, do you have that posted sure. anywhere? So, um, the the uh, the article that just looked at the thirty two different types of complementary alternative medicine that was published in Psychiatric Services in twenty twelve. Um, and then the article that focused just on yoga, mindfulness, and meditation other than mindfulness was published in the 2012 edition of the International Journal of Yoga Therapy. Uh, and you can also link to the PDF of that article uh, from the Veterans Yoga Project website. So what we found was that, um, and I thought it was really interesting, that 28% of the VAs that we surveyed already offered yoga to their veterans in some way, shape, or form. Hmm. Which, you know, I thought that was pretty amazing that it was already that high. Um, the mindfulness, it was up more like 70 or 80%. Uh, that offered mindfulness because mindfulness has become a part of many standard psychotherapeutic treatments. Sure. Uh, but one of the things that I found even more interesting was that among the 71% who didn't offer yoga, we asked them, well, why not? Right? Is it a lack of funding? Do you not? Is there not enough research to support it? Uh, are the veterans not interested? Lack of funding, lack of space. And the least uh, endorsed item was lack of veteran interest. So it's not like the veterans huh. don't want it. The most endorsed item was lack of trained staff. Lack of trained staff, lack of space, and lack of funding. And yeah. so that's really um, helped me sort of um, feel good about the work that I was doing out there, training yoga teachers how to work with trauma and some of these mental health issues. that, um, And also how to do that within a Western mental health care context mm -hmm. and how to bring yourself in as a part of an integrative treatment team. Sure, sure. Well, that's, uh, that's all fascinating. What other kinds of... Alternative uh, treatments are, uh, are is the VA using uh, primarily? Or what you are the name kinds of it, it's, it's being done somewhere out there. The uh, interesting thing is, is that we, we talk about the VA as if it's like one organization. Um, and in reality, it's really a bunch of little organizations and each mm -hmm. hospital is fairly autonomous. And what you see is that there's this bottom up um, uh, increase of using these complementary therapies. Whereas top down, you know, they're really pushing prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy, for example, for treating PTSD. But bottom up, what you're doing is you're getting yoga, you're getting all sorts of mindfulness based um, treatments. Um, you're getting equine therapy, yeah. you know, Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, uh, uh, but uh, acupuncture. What about acupuncture, that? yes, acupressure. Um, yeah, acupuncture is actually another uh, complementary therapy that. I hear a lot of great things about, and there are a lot of vets who are finding that it's really helping to uh, help them be able to control their stress levels and, and be able to uh, manage their symptoms as well. Yeah, well, that's that's great work. Uh, a friend of mine is actually um, uh, an energy medicine, energy psychology expert, and he was working with the the VA some years ago when he was the head of a national organization. Have you seen any movement like with uh, energy medicine at all? The, uh, EFT or the tapping or anything like that? Um, those types of therapies are out there too. Yeah, EFT here a lot of, um, I certainly hear people who have used EFT successfully uh, tend to be very excited about that and want to share that. I think when you start getting into 
some of these, you know, we, we call them CAM therapies or complementary alternative medicine therapies. Um, but I think it's sort of, uh, it, it does a disservice to lump all of these. Oh yeah. Uh, they're, they're, together. they're as ver varied as uh, yoga is varied, I think. So right, right. Exactly. And so if we're talking about something like yoga, it's, it's real, right? It's about breathing, yeah. right? When we talk about yoga, we're just helping people breathe easier. We're helping them focus more clearly. We're helping them rest more deeply. We're helping them move more freely, help right. some gratitude. These are things that are concrete and easy to understand and you can see it happening. When you start talking about energy work, um, it's a harder sell because it's, you're not talking, you can't talk about it in language, in Western healthcare language. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. Um, I think there's, that's going to be a slower movement uh, to get those kinds of things accepted. Yeah. You, have a, you have a page on your uh, website that's called Yogas for Sissies. Uh, is that kind of a, um, just kind of to demonstrate that uh, many, many very macho men do yoga? Um, yeah, that's exactly what it's for. The, <laughs> the truth is, is that when people think of yoga, many people think of, you know, the skinny girl on, in tights on the cover of Yoga Journal. Or, you know, I hear from uh, veterans all the time, well, I'm, I'm not flexible, so I can't do yoga. Exactly. And yeah. um, there's all these preconceived notions of what you have to be. And the truth is, is that yoga is the, the, the practices we're talking about have been used for warriors, by warriors for, for eons, right? This is yeah, like, true. these are basic self-mastery practices. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, and there are NFL players who use it and boxers. And um, yes, yeah, so we put up this page that says yoga is for sissies. And we link to different articles showing, um, you know, some of the big tough guys that sort of have this macho thing going on. Um, and we show that, you know, yoga is really just for anybody and for everybody because it's really about coming back to yourself. Yeah, and and it, we all can come back to ourselves and, and sort of feel a little better and be more in control. And do you, I haven't watched it. You really do have Mr. T saying, I pity the fool. <laughs> um, there, that's a really hilarious link, actually. Um, <laughs> it's just funny. You'd have to watch it yourself. Yeah. But it's a video of Mr. T that we found on the Internet that's of really funny. him doing yoga. And he's sort of making fun of it. Um, but it's very funny. Yeah. How has the reception been? You say that uh, the, the, the lowest barrier is uh, resistance among service members. Is it they're, they, they're pretty open to doing yoga by and large? By and large, yes. Um, which was surprising to me at first when I first got into this work. I especially thought that maybe the older Vietnam era veterans would be uh, a little less likely to embrace you know, some of these different practices where I found the exact opposite is true mm -hmm. because they work. You know, the hardest part is just getting somebody in the door and getting them to try, right? Just sitting and, you know, trying a different breathing technique or trying some sort of practice. But once people try these techniques, they make you feel better. They, they actually make you yeah. feel more relaxed and you actually have less tension in your body and your mind is a little clearer and you can breathe a little easier. And so, so they, you know, people know it worked for them, right? Yeah. The, the other treatments that have been offered to many of these veterans, they have found lacking. And so, um, although there tends to be a little bit of, you know, trepidation and like, what, really, we're going to do yoga? That we certainly get that sometimes. Um, once they try it, most, I don't know about most, many, many of the veterans that we have worked with have found something that they've been able to, to take with them and, and to use to help them in their recovery and in their resilience building. That's really awesome. So talk about, uh, you say there are many different kinds of yoga, and I notice you, you do specifically talk about yoga nidra, which is absolutely one of my favorites. Talk about the different kinds of uh, yoga that you find most effective. So uh, what I would say is that there's a lot of different styles or traditions of yoga, right? There's different, you know, every, you know, whether it be Iyengar or um, Ashtanga, or, you know, there's a lot of different schools and sort of methods of yoga. Um, but then within yoga, there are different practices. And so we focus on five primary tools or five yogic practices that we have found through experience and through my work with hundreds of veterans and active duty military. This is what we have found that works. So the first category of practices is breath work, or in yoga it's called pranayama, mm -hmm. um, and basically learning to regulate the breath and being able to use the breath to change the way your nervous system is functioning. The second group of tools are meditation tools, so being able to focus your mind. People with PTSD have very have a lot of difficulty with concentration, um, with being able to accept the thoughts that come into their mind and some of the intrusive thoughts and images. 
And so being able to provide different ways to meditate and focus the mind. The third category of tools are the movement postures. So most people, when they think of yoga, they think of, you know, bending your body in some way, shape or form. Um, so that third category of uh, practices are the mindful movement practices, being able to stay in the moment, to be able to keep the breath regulated even as you move your body and take your body through its natural range of motion. The fourth tool would be yoga nidra, which um, mm. we can spend a little time talking about. Yeah. Uh, also one of the practices that's more, uh, one of the heavily requested practices because veterans with PTSD, anybody with PTSD often has a lot of trouble sleeping. Mm -hmm. Sleep and nightmares are some of the hallmark symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And even though yoga nidra is intended to be an awake practice, an alert practice, it's a exploration of consciousness, um, what we have found is that it helps a lot of veterans sleep. Some of the veterans I work with say that they still, every night, this is how they go to sleep, is mm -hmm. they listen to a yoga nidra practice. And then the fifth category or the fifth tool is gratitude. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of impossible to simultaneously be grateful for something and feel like you're lacking something. And gratitude, the practice of gratitude, is one of the best cures for depression and anxiety and anger. And so that's our fifth tool is helping people develop this sense of gratitude for what we do have in our lives. And so by offering these tools to the veterans we work with, they figure out what works for them in which situation. This practice helps some people sleep. This practice helps me when I'm standing in line and getting anxious. Mm. This helps me when I'm getting agitated. And the idea is we offer these practices and let them discover their own strengths and what what tools they can develop within themselves to get them through their day, not just through their day, but to start to then connect with other people to find meaning and purpose, you know, maybe from their trauma and from their experience and to really ultimately find post-traumatic growth. That is just beautiful. That's just awesome. So is this uh, basically uh, what you're going to be teaching when you come to town in a couple of weeks? This is basically what I'm going to be teaching uh, when I come to town in a few weeks. Uh, we've developed it's a 15-hour training. It was really designed for yoga teachers, mm -hmm. although we've had a lot of other healthcare professionals and caregivers come through the training. Um, but the idea is we talk about these five tools. We practice these five tools. And we also talk about what trauma is and what happens in the body-mind complex when somebody deals with a traumatic event. <laughs> and how is it that these practices work? Why is it that yoga works? Right. And so we talk about some of those sort of neurological mechanisms of, uh, you know, mechanisms of action, of why these practices are helping the people that they are helping. Well, we do have a, a fair amount of doctors, uh, or at least we hope we do, that watch us. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Why, why does yoga work so effectively with PTSD? Well, the traditional treatment of PTSD um, uh, can be seen as a three-phase approach to PTSD treatment, right? So treatment for PTSD should follow these three phases, more or less. The first phase is to develop the coping skills, the self-regulation skills, the autonomic regulation skills, the ability to stay grounded. These skills are necessary because phase two is about processing your trauma. It's about digesting the trauma. It's about talking about the traumatic event and what it meant for you and how it affected you. And in order to be able to do that and to process it, you really do need these um, phase one skills. And so that's really where we, um, where these practices excel. And then uh, phase three is really about post-traumatic growth. It's about developing curiosity and play um, being able to uh, right here, um, to say what's next, right? So, okay, I'm dealing with my symptoms. I'm no longer dealing with symptoms of PTSD. Now what, right? Where, where do my values lie and how can I use these tools to now move in the direction of my values and my goals? Hmm. So we can actually, so these practices are not designed to replace other types of therapy for PTSD, but they're meant to complement it and to really make the job easier my job as a clinical psychologist is easier when my patient has some skills to self-regulate so that as we start talking about things that are just as painful as they can possibly be, right? We're talking about people who have been through experiences that, you know, just tear their, their whole zeitgeist apart, right? These are like, this is serious stuff. And so when you start talking about that, yes, you're going to get dysregulated and your heart rate's going to increase. And so my job as a clinician is easier when my patients are 
are taught those skills to be able to self-empower themselves instead of having to pop a benzodiazepine or you know valium right they learn the skills themselves to do it well it's fantastic work uh, god bless you and and everything you're doing um before we go let's talk a little bit more about the uh, the feathered pipe foundation you're on the board there now you said you started out there as a as a massage therapist when you're 18. talk about the uh the location and all the kind of work they do uh, i'm very happy to do that um so i was actually there the first two summers i was about seven or eight years old and it wasn't until i was 18 that i came back and started cleaning rooms and i spent nine summers um at the feathered pipe and uh they you know, being there really sort of saved my life um, and really opened my mind to some other possibilities. And um, they have been the fiscal. So I'm actually not no longer on the board of Feather Pipe Foundation. Oh, OK. But your, your um, website's Feather out Pipe of date. Is actually yeah. um, the, or was the fiscal sponsor of Veterans Yoga Project. Oh, wow. So while Veterans Yoga Project was getting our own 501c3 status, we were a fiscally sponsored program of Feather Pipes. So they have been awesome. hugely supportive of what we've been doing. And um, last summer, I have to, this is this is the best. So Veterans Yoga Project is involved in three things. We teach um, yoga teachers how to work with trauma. We provide resources and set up classes at yoga, uh, or at VAs and veteran facilities and treatment facilities. Um, but the third thing we do is retreats. And we did our first retreat last year at the Feather Pipe Ranch and we had 25 vets who had been through treatment for PTSD. Some of them were brought their spouses and they were able to spend three days just sort of hanging out at this place, which has for 40 years been a place where people go to find direction, where they transform. I mean, it's really, I don't really talk about sort of much of the woo woo hokey stuff and I try to stay pretty grounded in, mm -hmm. in, in Western science, but there is something magical about this place. There is a prana shakti about the feathered mm -hmm. pipe and uh, we did our first veterans retreat there and it was one of the most satisfying things i've ever done and the feedback that i got from the veterans and what it meant to them to be able to spend three days and decompress and learn some techniques and and be with each other it was phenomenal yeah, um, awesome. and so we are actually going to be doing hopefully two of those retreats next year um, one in the spring and one in the fall and so we're in busy sort of prepping and, and fundraising for that um, so, um, yeah, the Feather Pipe is just this amazing uh, educational retreat center. They've been doing it for 40 years, and it's really about raising consciousness. And I would encourage everyone to go there at least once in their lives. Where is it located exactly? It's uh, just outside Helena, Montana, right? You know, oh, inside okay. the, the Rocky Mountains, right by the Continental Divide. Montana's gorgeous, um, and they have, you know, amazing programs all summer long. That's fantastic. Yeah. Dan, it's been uh, it's been a great pleasure having you on. You're coming to town uh, November 14th through the 16th, Schoolhouse Yoga, uh, to teach yoga teachers uh, resilience for veterans. I just I just love that. Uh, thanks. Uh, before we go, anything uh, anything important that we missed that you want to mention or talk about? Um, I don't think so. I, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about the work that uh, that I'm doing. Um, and maybe just to remind your listeners that there are millions of men and women out there who are suffering because of us, right? They're, they went out there and they defended us. And I really do believe that it's our job to take care of those who have served us. And so um, my uh, final thought would be just to that would be to encourage your listeners to find some way to give back to those who serve us. Well said. Thank you, sir. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Okay. Well, that'll do it for another edition of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast. Uh, it's, boy, that was just a lovely, lovely thing to, to end there on. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dan Levy and uh, Jenna Leidy, who were with us today. And be sure you can join us every week here on uh, this podcast. We're on YouTube, iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, and now iHeartRadio. You can dial us up on your phone app and listen to us every week. And until next time, yins be careful out there. Mm -hmm.